year now. So, um, more and more partners. So, um, if meron din kayong ano, communities or organizations, uh, of course, you're welcome to, um, to be part of the big, uh, growing team. Uh, and um, I think, of course, uh, we're all happy that uh, today we'll be joined by Hillary. Uh, so, I'm looking forward to the talk. And um, hope everyone will also ano, uh, pay attention and uh, gain so much from this. Um, ready nyo na yung mga questions nyo for Hillary. This is a really parang uh, amazing opportunity and let's take advantage of it. Um, especially at this time, uh, it's so important to uh, keep and create connections. It's so hard now that we don't parang get to interact and even meet physically with a lot of people. So this is our venue for that. So uh, let's take advantage of it. Uh, and I'll also encourage everyone you know, to, to be more active, to find opportunities right? to, to contribute to your own um, organizations. I think we are all, um, um, we all see now that it's so important to you know, spread our love and joy uh, from physics and sciences. And we can all find ways uh, to do that. So, um, so yun, uh, uh, basically, I uh, just want to ano, yun nga, welcome everyone again. Um, and then as, uh, ano naman, as my parang, um, as a partner uh, through Pinoy Scientists, I also want to invite everyone to check out the Pinoy Scientists uh, platform on Facebook and Instagram. So you get to uh, meet many more uh, Pinoy Scientists like Hillary and me. Um, uh, and, yun, and I wish everyone a... Uh, uh, a good meet up and a good weekend. So I'll pass it on to um, Miss. I sorry um, to who will introduce the speaker, Miss uh, Je Jenny. Sorry, ah, I forgot. Um, I'll pass it on back to the host, Miss Ida, <laughs> to continue the program. Okay, thank you, Ma, for that warm message. Um, Miss Julina Colasi, take it away. Miss Jo, please. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Wait, that. Oh, yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. I am so pleased to be with you and to have the chance to introduce our guest speaker for today's physics meetup. Um, our speaker for today is a young science communicator and an enthusiast in learning, especially those things that is not in school. She is best known as the first Filipino who won Breakthrough Junior Challenge last 2017 for creating a three-minute video explaining the concept of relativity out of the 11,000 entries from 170 countries when she was still in grade 12 at the Philippine Science High School Eastern Visayas Campus. The challenge is an international science competi competition organized by the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, which includes Silicon Valley names like Sergey Brin of Google, uh, Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, and Yuri Milner of DST Global. A year before that, she won third place out of more than 6,000 entries. After completing her high school, she took a gap year and spent many of her days doing public talks on science all around the Philippines and once in the United Nations. Aside from that, she also published a book on mathematics called uh, Math Wizard Upper Primary. Right now, she is a physics student at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and an astrophysics researcher at the MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research in USA. She also makes hip hop dance covers with the MIT Asian Dance Team and also active in communicating, communicating science at MIT Philosophy Club and the Filipino Students Association. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming 
Miss Hilary Dayan Andales. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, I am actually it is currently 9 p.m. Friday night, and I just got I just finished submitting homework. So, medyo ano pa ako Medyo parang tense. But yeah, I'm super, super happy to be here with everyone, spending my Friday night with everyone. I know that there are a couple hundred people here, and it's such an honor for me to be speaking in front of you today, although virtually. But yes, so today is just supposed to be an informal chat, right? Like, this is supposed to be a physics meetup. And I just wanted to share my journeys. So my journey as a researcher, my journey as a science communicator, my journey as a human being. And I also wanted to take you on your own little journey across physics and across the universe. So yeah, let's get started. So I'll just share my screen. Let me try to do that. Okay. So can everyone see that? Can everyone see it? Yep, okay. So my talk today is entitled Journeys, Exploring and Sharing the Wonders of the Universe. So I'm going to be sharing two journeys, my own journey uh, as a researcher and science communicator. And I'm also going to take you on your own journey across the universe through my research. So I'll be sharing three things today. And also my name is Hilary Denandales and I'm currently a second year physics student here at MIT. So I just wanted to start from the very, very beginning. <laughs> and from the very, very beginning of my journey, I started uh, in Leyte. I grew up in Leyte. I was born in Cebu. And my family moved to Leyte when I was young. And ever since I was young, I always wanted to be a scientist. Actually, before I wanted to become a scientist, I wanted to become an astronaut. I know that everyone wanted to become an astronaut at some point, but then I realized that uh, to be an astronaut, it had to involve some sort of engineering. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to do engineering. So bye-bye astronaut dreams. So I just decided to become a scientist instead. But what drove me to want to become a scientist? Actually, it was this one book. So when I was young, about five years old, my parents gave me this astronomy book that was as tall as I was, little five-year-old me. And then that astronomy book told, literally blew my mind. So before I saw that book, I looked up at the sky, right? And when I looked up at the sky, I thought that the sun was just really tiny. It was just a tiny lamp in the sky, the size of a coin, the size of a coin. But after I read that book, it told me that one million Earths could fit inside the sun. And that blew my mind so much. And it also told me about the sheer size of the universe, the sheer vastness of the universe. And that also blew my mind. Like, here on Earth, we measure, we measure distances using kilometers, right? But in the universe, we measure distances in terms of light years, the distance that light travels in a year. So that just blew my mind. And for a visual, for more visual, um, visual representation of what I learned through the book, let me show you this. So this was like how I saw the book. So like, I learned that stars are not, actually not lamps in the sky, but massive nuclear reactors in space. And they just kept getting bigger and bigger. And in fact, the sun was not the biggest star in the universe. It was just a really tiny one. And you could keep finding bigger and bigger structures in the universe. And that just blew my mind so much. And it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Like, wow, I was so inspired. And at that point, I knew that I wanted to keep thinking about the universe. I knew I wanted to keep thinking about all these big things, all these crazy wild things that happen in the vast cosmos. So I felt at that point, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to become a scientist. And that's how it started. And I just kept following, I just kept following that path. And then after that, uh, my parents also, during my youth also, my parents kept telling me stories about the great scientists. So instead of stories like Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, my parents would tell me stories about Marie Curie and how her gene and her genius and how she powered through all of the obstacles despite being a woman in science in the early 1900s. They told me about Einstein's revolutionary idea and about uh, how he shattered all expectations back then and about Charles Darwin's adventures in the Galapagos Islands. 
And because of that, I became really inspired and I became even more motivated to become a scientist. And then fast forward a bit into elementary school, I joined the Metropac MTAP Dep Ed Math Challenge every year. And I started joining when I was in first grade. You can see the, how I grew through this competition from grade one up until grade 10. And yeah, so this was to complement my love for science. I learned how to love math through this competition and it also kept building me up. This was my goal every year. And then fast forward again to grade 11, I found this competition called the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. Actually, it was my mom who found it. She was scrolling through Facebook and then she found this post said, calling entries for the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. And then she told me about it. And at first I was like, okay, do I join or not? Because I was, I was scared, right? Because it was an international competition. And when you join an international competition, you're going to be up against everyone in the world. I was terrified of that at first, but I was like, I just have to give it a shot, right? Like, I just have to try it. I'm not even going to expect to win. I'll just try it. And even if I lose, even if I fail, it's not really a failure, right? Because I personally don't believe in failure. I always say that if you fail, you don't really fail. You only learn. So I stayed true to, to that advice and I started it. And I started making my entry. And then fortunately, I won during my second try. And this was the part which was mentioned in the introduction earlier. And so after that, my life just literally turned around. So I had, up, to, up until that point, I had my plan for my life really set. But when this competition came around, it just like, parang lumiko lang siya suddenly, all of a sudden, and it really changed my life. And so I wanted to share uh, the, some, a short clip from that awarding ceremony because that my speech during the awarding ceremony actually still captures the spirit of my attitude toward science and science communication. So, okay. Can everyone hear it? For her short film, Relativity and the Equivalence of Reference Frames. The winner of the 2017 Breakthrough Junior Challenge is Hilary Andalas. looked up to two kinds of stars, those that shine at night, enchanting my mind about the universe, and those that shine before me now, these amazing scientists, inspiring me with their genius and tenacity to pursue the truth. I'm grateful that this award has allowed me to become a rising star with even bigger dreams. May this inspire more young people, especially my dear Filipinos, to look up and become scientists themselves the stars that we all should look up to. Thank you to all those who supported me throughout this journey. Maraming salamat po. Okay, so this is actually from three years ago, right? Why do I share this now? This is old news. But I really just wanted to share it today because the things I said in my speech are still the messages that I keep carrying today. Like every time I'm asked to speak, these are always the core messages that I intend to share. I want, I still look up to the scientists and I still look up to the stars and I still want to keep encouraging uh, the younger people, especially Filipinos, to pursue science. And so that's going to be the gist of my whole talk today. And so after that, my life, as I said earlier, my life really, really turned around. And then after that, up until that point, actually, I really just wanted to become a physicist, right? I wanted to become a scientist. But then it changed. So after I got, after my awarding ceremony, I went back to Philippine Science High School. That was my high school then. And we held this press conference for local journalists. So my win kind of got some news coverage uh, in local news. So we invited some journalists to cover my story. And then that day, one one of the journalists asked me, Hillary, since you uh, are so uh, inspired by science and you want to keep communicating it to people, what advice do you have for us journalists to communicate it to the people? Because for us, we think that science is intimidate, is boring, intimidating, and useless. And for me, 
I was I was so shocked to hear that because uh, as I mentioned earlier already, I was already so inspired about science and about the universe. And to hear someone say this, to, to hear someone say that science is boring, intimidating, and useless, that was really a shock to me. I was really sad to hear that. And so up until that point, I only wanted to become a physicist. But at that day, I really started changing my directions. And at that point, I also wanted to become a science communicator aside from being an astrophysicist. So I wanted people to realize that science is in fact not boring, not intimidating, and, and not useless. And this is why I do all the things I do today. And in fact, one of the other things also that inspired me to become a science communicator is uh, my experience from Yolanda. So back, it was in grade 8, 2013. And uh, the day before Yolanda, there were some warnings, right? I, I, I'm not sure if many of you remember that. But if some of you are from Leyte, then you probably remember it. And so the day before that, there were some warnings sent out and then they told us to evacuate. But that day, many people didn't evacuate. And include, that included my family. My family didn't evacuate as well. Because we were parang kampante. Nakampante kami na, okay, sanay na kami sa bagyo. Hindi, hindi, this couldn't be too bad, right? So we, we just kept complacent. But then the next day, the next day, it was, you all saw the news. It was complete destruction. There were thousands of people dead. And actually, I was in the middle of that destruction. Uh, I lived in Palo Leite, and the typhoon, the eye of the typhoon passed right above my area. And that meant that we really had to climb up. The storm surge was really in our house. We really had to climb up to the trusses of our house and we held on there for many many hours because the storm surge napuno yung buong bahay namin within a few minutes and so after that i realized that maybe more lives could have been saved if uh, the government or the media portrayed the dangers of the typhoon yolanda more accurately or if people knew about the importance of weather predictions or if people knew about the science of disasters and that also strengthened my commitment to that mission to make people not realize that science is just exciting but also for them to realize that science has life-saving value and so that is the other half of my mission now aside from being just a physicist now i also want to be a science communicator and after that i graduated from high school i took a gap year and then during my gap year i got a lot of opportunities to speak uh, all around the philippines uh, about science and my journey in it and it was a really fun time i i really loved that year it was really inspiring i got to meet and speak to many kinds of people from elementary school students from business exe executives from people in the united nations um journalists science journalists uh, science teachers or all kinds of teachers and it was so inspiring for me to meet um, people from all around the philippines all kinds of backgrounds and uh, when I was speaking to them, my mission was really just to get them excited about science. No matter what background they had, I really just wanted them to see the value and the excitement behind the field. And one of my highlights uh, during that gap year, or during that gap year, or my science communication journey in general, was this. Uh, this was me at Los Angeles. I got invited to Adobe uh, to speak by Ad Adobe to speak about my journey uh, in their big creativity conference. So that was really huge for me. And they actually found me through my YouTube channel. When I posted my entry for the Breakthrough Journey Challenge, one person from Adobe contacted me because they saw that I was using their platform. So they contacted me like, oh, Hillary, do you want to be, <laughs> do you want to be interested in, do you want to work with us at some point? And so I said, yes. And so now we're still working together to use the platform to advance science communication. And then another one of my highlights is from uh, when I spoke at the United Nations, I got invited there to speak at the United Nations in Vienna about uh, the importance of science communication and how we can use those concepts to apply to nuclear energy and to uh, mitigate the effects of climate change. And another one of my highlights as well was I got to collaborate with ABS-CBN to make a really cool science video about Pinoy microsatellites. So I'll share just a few seconds from that, from that video.
Lift off. May humigit kumulang 8,000 satellites na nakapalibot sa Earth ngayon. Mula sa lupa, hindi natin sila nakikita. Pero mula sa outer space, ito ang itsura nila. Dalawa rito ay gawang Pilipino, sina Diwata 1 at Diwata 2, ang kauna-unahang microsatellites ng Pilipinas. Pero ano nga ba ang ginagawa nila doon sa taas? Nagahanap ng aliens o black holes? Naglalakbay papunta sa ibang planeta? Hindi po. Sila ay mga Earth Observation Satellites. Layunin nilang kunan ng pictures ang Earth, lalo na ang Pilipinas. Okay, so that, that was just a bit. You can find the rest of the video on YouTube. So we worked together with ABS-CBN. I made the script and the content and they worked with me to edit it and we filmed it together during my gap year. It was a really exciting time. And it was, it was such an honor for me to get to work with ABS-CBN to make something that I really love. So next, uh, and then after that, my gap year was over and now I find myself here at MIT. And so I started, I started college here at MIT in the fall of 2019, so September. I moved in here during September of 2019 and now I'm currently a second year student studying physics and I'm also doing a minor in astronomy and philosophy. So I just wanted to share a bit, some pictures from my life here and also some things about my research. So here's a bit of the life at MIT and I'll take you a bit through the pictures. So the top left is me with my dad in front of the iconic MIT dome. It was a really a big moment for me because uh, my parents were really the ones who inspired me to take up science and now I get to take my dad to MIT and that was such a huge moment. And, uh, To be honest, I didn't really expect that I would go here. And it was such a big dream come true for me. And next is the next photo to the right is me with the Filipino Students Association. So you have a little club of Filipino students from the Philippines and from the US. And we hang out sometimes, we organize events, it's really fun. And the next is me with Mark Mapalo. He's uh, actually a tardigrade scientist. He was recently, very recently featured in Pinoy scientist, and he is also a late native like me. And below that are some of my friends from my dorm, and then some of my friends from my dance club. And then, so I'll also share some pictures about my classes. So on the top left is my big differential equations class in MIT, and then next is a picture of the dome. I took an astronomy class last year, and then we had to do some observation, some observation nights and we would climb up the top floor of one building here and then we'd point our telescopes to the sky. It's kind of sad though because it's, the sky is kind of polluted. And then next was me trying to take uh, pictures for my astronomy class in the dead of winter. So it was negative 12 degrees Celsius when I took that picture. So it was really freezing cold that time, but I had to do it. I had to do it for the science. And then some pictures below. Uh, Below that is just from my research and from me doing my problem sets, like what I did just a few hours earlier. <laughs> and then next is some pictures from my physics classes. And at the bottom right is me with one of my favorite scientists, Sean Carroll. He's a physicist and I got to meet him when he did a lecture at Harvard. And just some random pictures from my life here. And then uh, some pictures of me meeting my inspirational scientists my scientists of inspiration so i just my one of my goals is really to meet as many scientists as i can and i want to take pictures and get autographs from all of them so the left half is me with the scientists that i met during the breaks junior challenge and the right is uh the group of scientists that i met uh while i'm here at well since i've been here at mit so we have math mathematician Terence Stau, physicist ed Whitten. And then physicist Alan Guth, who is also currently my professor, Brian Green, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, she's so awesome, and then and so on. And then I also got to visit uh, the grave of Marie and Pierre Curie in France, and then the grave of Ludwig Boltzmann. And then I got to meet the director of CERN, the biggest uh, home of one of the biggest science instruments that humans have made. So that was really an amazing time for me. And also this is during my gap year. But so these are all the inspirations that keep me going. 
and here at MIT and ever since before that. But now I also want to turn again to a new part of my talk, which is my research. So since I've been here at MIT, I've been doing research. I've been doing it for a couple of, not a couple of months, but a couple of semesters. And my research is in a field called galactic archaeology. And what is galactic archaeology? It sounds kind of weird, right? Like galaxies and archaeology, those don't fit together. So what we do, so first let's think about archaeology, right? So we study artifacts from the present. So for example, like fossils. And then we use the information from those fossils to infer what the old earth looked like, right? So that's what paleontologists, paleontologists do. They try to take dinosaur fossils and from the bones and from what they could infer from their DNA and all of the organic material that's left in the fossils, they could guess what the old earth looked like. And that's what we do, but in, this, in the scale of the universe. So for us, we take cosmic fossils. And these cosmic fossils are called ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. And these ultra-faint dwarf galaxies, using the information in their stars and their gases and how they formed, we can infer what the early universe looked like. So the early universe from billions and billions and billions of years ago. And that's super, super cool. So that's what, that's what I mean when I say galactic archaeology. So how do we do that? So these ultra-faint dwarfs are the oldest and faintest galaxies in the universe. They're like really, really tiny, and they're faint, and they're really, really old. So that's what makes them a challenge to do. So here around the Milky Way, we, we have our own galaxy, right, the Milky Way, and then around it are a bunch of satellite galaxies. So kind of like how Jupiter has 60 plus moons, right? Milky Way also has its own smaller galaxies orbiting it. And then we have some of those big satellite galaxies like uh, Sextans Dwarf, Large Magellanic Cloud, Small Magellanic Cloud, uh, Ursa Minor Dwarf, and so on. But so, some of those are the ultra faint dwarf galaxies, and they're really hard to observe using telescopes. Because you know, I, I said that they were really faint and really old. Oh no, really faint and really tiny. So that's what makes them hard to observe. So what do we do instead? We take another approach. We do our research to find and investigate ultra-faint dwarfs using, not using telescopes, but using a computer simulation. So I'll show you a bit of a clip from the computer simulation that I work on. So this is uh, one visualization that the computer simulations I work on made. So what do we see here? <laughs> so here is, it's basically just, uh, how do I describe this? It's basically just a replay, a rewind of the history of the universe from the beginning. So here you can see T, right? T on the top, right? T, six, five, four, three, it keeps getting lower and lower, giga years. So what does that mean? So it's moving forward in time from the old many, many billion years to the present. So now we have reached the present. And so what does that do? So what is actually happening here? So we take information from currently observed, uh, current observations using telescopes, and we plug that in, we feed that into a big, big computer, and then we try to put some properties, we put some equations in and to govern how all of these things should move. And then we take all of these big boy computers and then let it run for many, many hours, many, many CPU hours. So it's not a typical laptop. It's really huge and it takes up buildings and rooms. So it's really huge and it's super awesome. And from this simulation, we pick out certain things that correspond to the ultra faint dwarfs. So we can take the data that this computer simulation produces and then so it spits out data, right? So it, all the data is just in the form of numbers. And then from those numbers, we can actually find information that identify certain galaxies as ultra faint dwarfs. So from all these things that you see here, like, so the pink galaxies, the pink parts are where matter is most dense. So the pink parts are where there are more stars, more things going on, and the darker parts are where space is more empty. And so the denser part here at the center is actually our Milky Way. And then using the simulated Milky Way, we search for, we search around the neighborhood of the Milky Way. And then we pick out 
things that correspond to ultra faint dwarfs. So we know that the masses and the ages and distances of ultra faint dwarfs are a certain number. So we use those properties to search for that in the computer simulation. So I hope that <laughs> I hope that kind of makes sense. But yeah, so that's the work that I do. And so how do I accomplish that work? So basically, it's just a lot of coding, <laughs> actually. So I just sit on my computer a lot. And then so like this is some of the code that I use is actually just some functions and some of the catalog. It's not very confidential. It doesn't really mean that much <laughs> to be so it's OK. And then it, it involves making a lot of plots. So like plots like these things. So these don't have context, so it's OK to share. <laughs> And so I made, I made all of these last summer from all of the data that the computer simulation fed us. And after that, after I made some investigations, uh, I, had, I actually had to present, present it to our department, our lab here at MIT Kali Institute. And so this is part, this is part of my, my presentation here. And the formal title is actually Environmental Differences in Ultrafaint Dwarf Galaxy Formation. So we were specifically trying to look at the question if are all ultrafaint dwarfs the same? Because ultrafaint we kind of think that ultrafaint dwarfs may be the same, but we're not really sure. So we're trying to use this simulation to really quantify those differences. So yeah, that's really my research. And then, so actually, this is just all of the research that I've done up until this point. But actually, I just also just wanted to share this one more story to before I end. So up until since up until now, I've taken you from my journey since I was young, since I was five years old, up until now that I'm currently a second year physics student. And many people might think that I that it's really easy for me to like do science and all these things because I really love it. But not many people actually realize how much of a struggle it is. <laughs> and in fact, for me, I actually really struggle with physics. And that's what evidence is my homework from earlier. It was really hard. <laughs> but so I, ca I can really relate to what everyone says that physics is hard. But how do I really try to keep going, even though it's really hard? It's re the math gets really confusing sometimes. All of these concepts get really hard to understand. How do I try to keep going? Well, I just really try to rem remember this one story, and this is the story that I'm about to share. So I wanted to share a story about the most important image that humanity has ever taken, arguably the most important image that humanity has ever taken. And this, is, this starts with the Hubble Space Telescope. So I think some of you have heard about the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's a space telescope that takes pictures of the sky, and it's not on Earth, it's orbiting in space. So that, that's what makes it super cool. And then, one day in the 1990s, so wait, the Hubble Space Telescope is actually responsible for all the pictures, the cool pictures that you've taken, like nebulae, um, all those cool galaxies you've seen. I'm sure you've seen those pictures from NASA, right? All those cool galaxies, all those cool nebula, and even part of this picture here, <laughs> NASA, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is responsible for that. And so it takes pictures of all these interesting things that you could see. But then in the 1990s, one of, one of the people in NASA said, what if instead of pointing, pointing it to interesting things, we point it to an absolutely boring patch of the sky, like a patch of the sky that's completely black. And then everyone was mad about that. Like, why would you do that? It costs millions to focus this telescope. And it, a, lot of, a lot of people, like, a lot of people are waiting in line to use this telescope and you're out here proposing to point it at absolutely nothing. And people were mad. And so how, but eventually people agreed because the spirit of science, right, is to discover things. And even though that idea was crazy, they eventually agreed. And so they eventually did that. They pointed the Hubble Space Telescope into this small, uh, this small point of sky, really dark spot, like imagine a grain of sand on your finger and then you put it at arm's length and that's, that's the size of the black patch of the sky that they were taking pictures, they were pointing it at. And then they focused the Hubble Space Telescope on that spot for 10 days. 
And people, like, what kind of picture would you expect from that? Because it was just a black spot, right? So, of course, you would expect a black spot to come out of that. Well, duh, right? Since it's black, of course, you'd expect a black spot. But the picture that they obtained caught them by surprise. And this was the picture that they got, ultimately. And so they just waited and waited and waited for all of the light to come in. And this was what they got. This was crazy. Imagine just a small blank spot in the sky gives you this kind of picture. And every single dot in there is not a star. It's a galaxy. And then in every galaxy, there are a hundred billion stars. And then around those stars, there may be planets. There may be life outside those uh, in those planets and it's just wild this is just one small spot in the sky right imagine how many spots like this are around the sky so how many galaxies are there how many planets are there how many stars are there that's just wild to me like, this is my favorite picture i love looking at it and every time i feel demotivated about doing physics i just try to think about this picture again and i actually have this picture in front of my table like every time I start to get discouraged, I just look at this picture again. So if ever you want to become a scientist as well, try to think about the story and try to feel how amazing this is. And I also want, I wanted to share this other picture. And this picture is a famous pale blue dot picture. And that, re, that small dot in there, that's the Earth. And this picture was taken, this picture was taken when a spacecraft, the Voyager spacecraft, passed by Saturn, and that those rings, that that line is from the rings of Saturn, and this really captures the perspective of how vast the universe is and how tiny we are with respect to it. And this is really a, an amazing quote that I wanted to share with everyone. So look again at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of. Every human being who ever was lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religion, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and gatherer, every mother and father, hopeful child, every corrupt politician, every supreme leader, every saint and sinner, on a moat of dust suspended in a sunbeam. That's just so inspiring to me. And to some people, this, make, this may make us feel insignificant, right? Like, we don't matter. Like, what's the point of doing all this? But for me, it's actually inspiring. It feels the opposite. Because, I mean, despite how small we are, we get to know all of these things about the universe. We get to find out things about the universe just from pen and paper, just from our little computer simulations, just from our brains that are really tiny. And then we get to find out all of that. And that's really wild to me, and that's super inspiring. So that's what makes me keep going with science. And when it gets hard, I just keep thinking about that. And so since this is a physics meetup, I also just wanted to, to give you a little, like just a big, big map of physics. And the physics that I'm talking about is just one corner of physics in astrophysics. But there are many, many things you can do. You can look into all of these little subfields uh, in your free time if you're interested. And so. When, as I end, I just wanted to give you some few action items before I end this talk. So what can you do uh, in light of this talk? So I've been mentioning everything about my journey from my beginnings as a little aspiring scientist to a science communicator and now an astrophysicist in training. So what can you do uh, as an aspiring, maybe an aspiring physicist or also a science enthusiast or just a person who's interested in these things. So I would encourage you to see science in a new light and encourage peers to do the same. That's really what I've been doing and I would want you to carry that message with me as well. And if you're interested, maybe consider being a scientist. In the Philippines in particular, we need as many people as we can. And next, if you don't want to become a scientist, then amplify and listen to the voices of Filipino scientists. Our Filipino scientists are brilliant, but they also struggle a lot, especially with the research infrastructure. And sadly, there's not enough funding, so we need to really support them and amplify their voices so that they can be heard. And one way you can do that is by following and sharing posts in Pinoy Scientists, who's a partner of this event, and then 
also science chat ph and then there's uh currently more and more science science accounts in social media so i'd encourage you to find those and then next is call for better government support for science and support the work of science organizations so that's really all of what i wanted to say today and i hope that you learned something from my journey from my five-year-old little five-year-old self in data to here 21 <laughs> in boston so yes Thank you everyone for your attention and I really enjoyed being with you today. Thank you very much, Miss Hilary. Hi, I am Bianca. I will be your moderator for this session. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, it's my right. So thank you very much for sharing your journey with us and also your research. As a for counting as of the moment, you are joined with 283 participants and I'm sure they are bursting with questions. And we are very excited to ask you the questions that they um, log in here, our chat box. But for questions, may I also request our participants that we are very excited to hear from you. So that if you'd like to ask a question, can you just uh, click the raise your hand icon? Uh, you can find that one in the lower part of your screen. And then once we acknowledge you, we'll be unmuting your mic so you can deliver your questions live to our speaker. However, if you have uh, difficulties in your signal or in your audio, of course, you can log in your questions to our chat box and also on Facebook Live, and we will be reading it for you. Okay, so let's start the ball rolling. Who would like to go first? So, uh, okay, since I have not seen any hands raising yet, I'm going to ask the first question, which is, um, which was um, asked in our uh, Facebook live streaming. Okay, so here's a question from Mel Theo de la Cruz. Um, he asked if, do you ever experience an imposter syndrome and what ways did you cope up? <laughs> Actually, I was really just, I was just thinking about that today. Oh, wait, is my audio bad? Okay, okay, that's it. Okay. Um, <laughs> do I experience imposter syndrome? Yes, I do a lot, <laughs> especially now that I'm here in MIT where everyone's super, super smart. And like sometimes you kind of don't feel like you're enough. And I feel that and I can relate to people when they say that they feel the same way. And the way I cope is really to just like remember the story that I just told you earlier about how amazing the universe is and like I'm not, I'm not, I'm studying physics because I want to keep doing that, because I want to keep thinking about those things and not because I want to compete with other people. So I just try to keep it uh, inward, just me, I just focus on myself and try not to compete. And I also just, I also just try to remember where I came from. And where I came from was in a really small town, poor neighborhood in Leyte. And now that I'm here, that's just wild to me to think that my life uh, somehow naging ganito. And that's super dream, a dream come true. And I'm super grateful. And just thinking about how grateful I am makes me feel better about everything. So yeah, so for uh, just for advice, I would recommend just thinking about where you came from. Like, uh, think about uh, your humble beginnings and then think about how far you've come and I'm sure you've all climbed up you've had an upward trajectory and if you think about that you'll feel a lot better and to feel like parang yung feeling na imposter syndrome that's always normal but try to just try to think about that it's a it's a process okay the next question is from Rona and she asked, what was the hardest difficulty you encountered that you were close to giving up? And how did you cope with it? And what lesson have you learned from it? Um, close to giving up? I'm actually not sure. I don't think I've ever given up on something. It's like, because for me, I'm really just that kind of person that keeps pushing through. If I want it, I'll really try to work into it and i don't think i've really given up on anything oh actually no i remember maybe my math <laughs> you, you math 
<laughs> yung max ko kasi uh, I uh, di ba minention ko kanina na I really wanted I really joined a lot of math competitions and when you're in the math competition sphere your dream is to really join the international mathematical olympiad right <laughs> and that was my pipe dream when i was like early high school but i eventually realized that it was not fit for me so i gave up on it but it wasn't really a uh, bad giving up parang it there wasn't really much of a struggle i just For me, it was not giving up, but more of a refocusing. Parang lumiko ako. I refocused my energy because I know that if I continued to dream about reaching this Olympiad, medyo uh, impossible. So I just wanted to shift my focus into another thing that I was good at, and that was science communication and also physics research. So for everyone, if you are close to giving up, think of it as a refocusing. Parang Go to the path that is that has less resistance, <laughs> and yeah, just try to think of it that way in a more positive way. Parang hindi siya, so it doesn't feel like it's as much of a struggle. Relatable. I'm sure uh, everyone relates to it. The <laughs> next question is uh, from Romel Leo B. Alojado, and he asks, "What for you is the difference between a scientist and an engineer?" Oh, the well, engineers for me, like in simple words, they just they they make things happen. <laughs> the scientists are the ones who really who think about things, and then the engineers are the things who make those thoughts happen. And there's a really big difference in terms of how they do their jobs. Because for science, it's more of like frontier things that they pursue. Meanwhile, for engineers, it's They really try to build things and then they optimize things. And like, there's really a different methodology in how they pursue it. I'm not super familiar with how engineers do their jobs, but for me, it's very different. Most application oriented, you engineers, and then science is more like, uh, like pushing through the frontiers of knowledge. And yeah. Right. So on our next question, I'm going to welcome Mr. Miles Angelo Sodehana to ask a live question to you. So, um, hello po. Can you hear me po? Yeah. Yes. Um, um, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate you, congratulate you po sa fundings. So I have oh, thank two you. questions po. First, well, does um, does biases exist for the caterpillar project in Halo's selection by its size? And the second question is about the stellar velocity dispersions of U UFDs. Po. Are they free from interference of systematic uncertainties such as binary stars and foreground contamination? I'm really curious about your research. Po. Uh, <laughs> I see you read the paper because I, I, I oh, remember. Po. I remember that. But yeah. Um, The first question is about the biases in selecting halos. I remember that they don't, they don't, they tried their best not to bias it in terms of halo size. So that's what I remember from the paper. And then for the velocity dispersions, wait, what was the question again? Can you repeat? This? Um, uh, are they free from interference or are they robust from the interference of systematic uncertainties? Ah. Like um, maybe there's a contamination. Ah, okay. Yeah, the yeah. system. Yeah. So for our simulation, there's going to be contamination. So what contamination means is parang uh, you get really low resolution galaxies. You want high resolution galaxies and like along the edges of the simulation means and may mga maling resolution. So for for our simulation, we tried to not we tried our best to not have those contaminations, but it's going to be inevitable. And I can't, sadly, I can't say that much because that's not the part of the research that I work on. This research is really, really huge. So there's a lot of people working on it. I feel like oh, well. 50 people. So I'm working on a really tiny corner of the project. So I don't want to oh, say more if like, I'm not the expert in this part. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations to your yeah. funding again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Miles. Next on 
I'd like to welcome Augustine Lawrence to ask his question live to Miss Hillary. Uh, hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah, uh, I actually have two questions. So uh, the first one's about your research. So uh, what are the what are the implications that uh, that ultra faint dwarf galaxies have on the evolution of galaxies? And like, is it like do they sort of aggregate into larger galaxies like the Milky Way? Uh, second question, uh, I kind of want to become a science communicator in the future. So, uh, what, what advice can you give for an aspiring science communicator? Okay, so for the first question, do ultrafaint dwarfs eventually aggregate to form galaxies? Okay, so for everyone here, just to get parang to, to help everyone contextualize, like to put the research in context. So I'll, I'll take you a bit through how like how the theory of galaxy formation actually works. So in the early, early universe, there wasn't a lot of structure, right? So the early universe was just a big soup <laughs> of parang walang structure, walang galaxies. It was just flat, soup, boring, no structure. But then there were tiny fluctuations, right? So parang just like how one, a bit of snow could snowball into a bigger and bigger thing. Uh, it could start growing bigger and bigger. That's the same thing kind of the same thing with galaxies. So you have, uh, in the early universe, if you have this one point na medyo, maram, mis, medyo mas malaki siya compared to the other things, then that object is going to have more gravity compared to the objects around it, right? And so that is going to keep attracting other things into it. And that is going to keep going on and on. Parang, uh, it's going to keep uh, growing and growing and growing. And those little fluctuations grow to become the structures that we see today, the galaxies and the nebula, the nebulae, the gas formations and all of that. And like all these super clusters. So these, uh, all these small structures first started out as really tiny and then they grew to become the galaxies that we see today. So to answer the question, yes, these ultra faint dwarf galaxies are actually those old things, the old small things in the old universe and they carried themselves up to here. And the way that galaxy formation works is that all these small things just keep combining together to form a bigger and bigger thing. So uh, that's the way we currently think about how galaxies form. And so, yeah, again, to answer the question, that's really how ultrafaint dwarfs work. And some ultrafaint dwarfs today uh, haven't been Parang, parang hindi pa sila kinain ng Milky Way. <laughs> Kasi di ba, ultrafaint dwarfs are satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And some of them still haven't, uh, still haven't been, parang, hindi pa sila, yun na, hindi pa sila kinain <laughs> ng Milky Way. And so, because of that, we can, they're pristine relics. Hindi pa sila naapektuhan ng environment nila. Because of that, they're pristine relics of the early universe. Kasi, hindi pa sila naapektuhan ng other galaxies around them. And, so because they're pristine relics, we use the information that they carry to infer things about the early universe. Yes. And so, okay, next question. So advice for science communicator. So I would first uh, advise, my first advice is to, of course, like find stories that excite you. And because those stories are going to be the stories that you keep telling people. And those are the stories that keep you going as a science communicator. If you, you know, if you ever feel like it's hard or if it's not worth it, you can just keep remembering that and uh, that will keep you going. And then also start with your community. So start with the people around you. You don't have to go big, like go speak at events. Actually, the most important science communication is when you communicate with your family or your friends. because That's the most important part. Like, for example, if you're telling your parents to wear a mask when they're not, or if you're telling your parents about how vaccines work, when they currently don't know about it. That's already science communication. And if you encourage people around you, you, keep, you, just, you can just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger in your scope. And eventually, you'll maybe start working with the government and try to convince them of science policies. And then maybe you'll start going international. <laughs> also, you just start with your community first. And then find the things that you love the most. And then try to share that. Thank you so much for that. Next on our um, live question session is Mr. Vaughn Philip Perez. Vaughn, are you there? Uh, 
Yes, yes. 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 Hello, po. Hello. Yes, meron po akong question. Ano po yung, yung mga bagay na i-consider sa physical science? Kasi I learned a lot of fun eh, about science. Gusto ko pang matuto ng iba pang mga ano doon, mga bagay-bagay. Mm -hmm. Tapos, oh, sorry, di ko narinig yung question niyo. Ay, gusto ko Ano po yung mga bagay na dapat consider sa physical science? Ano yung mga, like, ano yung mga subjects under physical science? Yun ba yung question? Ang ganun po. Ah, okay. Opo. So actually, it goes back to the map that I showed you earlier, right? So that was just, actually, that was just a small part of the whole physical science. Uh, I can go back to sharing it. So can you see it? So ito. So ito yung, yes. if you're interested in learning more about, so physical science is big, huge. <laughs> and it includes uh, many things besides physics. And physics is just a small part of physical science. And so you can, these are all the small subfields of it. You could just like Google these things that are in boxes if you're interested in learning more about it. So things like cosmology, astrophysics, atomic theory, quantum field theory. Some of these are really advanced. So I would recommend just uh, going to YouTube because there are a lot of YouTube videos that explain these things for uh, audience, for a layman audience, like people who haven't gone through college physics. So I would recommend going through YouTube first and then searching all those, uh, all those keywords. Uh, you can, yung map na pinakita ko, you could actually find it on Google, map of physics, and you can use that as a guide. And then after that, you just dive into a deep rabbit hole in Google. Like every time when nahanap ka na link, click mo lang ulit yung link, click mo lang ulit, click mo lang ulit. And then uh, by, uh, maybe after some months, you'll have amassed a lot of uh, knowledge. So yeah, I would recommend uh, just using those keywords that I showed in the, in the map and going through YouTube. Oh, did I answer your question? So I hope, I hope that answered your question. Okay, I think you did, Hillary. I think you did. Okay, so the next question is, I'm going to, allow me to read this, uh, this question because this is a testament that physics meetup is reaching a lot of audience. Okay, this is from Mr. R.V. Perez. And he says, oh. I am a business executive with personal interest in astrophysics. I met you when you were a guest speaker in our company, PTC. Ah, uh, yes. I know. <laughs> and his question is, do you plan on doing any research on philosophy and astrophysics? And lastly, perhaps you can explain to the rest your background photo. That's dark matter. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay, so do I plan on... Okay, so first, uh, nice to uh, hear about hear from you again, well, Sir RV. And it was... Uh, their company was one of the places that I spoke at during my gap year. And um, do I plan on doing research in philosophy and, and astrophysics? Yes, I actually do plan on doing philosophy research. I'm not sure how to do it though, because I don't have background in doing humanities research. But that's what makes it fun, right? <laughs> and I've already gone in, I've, I'm already looking at some professors that I want to work with. And I'm planning to do that within the next uh, several months maybe try to apply for research funding on that and then try to do a project. And one thing I'm really interested in is philosophy of science in particular, because philosophy is a really, really big field. Like there's metaphysics, like questions are, yung mga question to know what is real? <laughs> what is, what things are even real? So that's one part of it, one part of philosophy. And then there's another part of philosophy called epistemology. Like what things can we know? So all these really crazy whack abstract questions and then there's also of course philosophy like political philosophy like what government systems work best and all these other kinds and the part of philosophy that i'm particularly interested in is philosophy of science and that is kind of like a subfield of epistemology and the questions that i'm really interested in uh, looking at is how do scientists 
come up with knowledge because science is not like science is a very complicated process but it's very human made we think we think that this process drives us closer to the truth but after even though it's even though it does that it's still after all a human process and it's not immune to all these human biases and all these flaws in our methodologies and all these flaws in our in the way that we look at the world and so those are the kinds of questions that i want to ask like how do scientists actually come up with knowledge and how do scientists come together and how do they try to contain their own their own personal biases and how do they try to collate all of that to make a more coherent view of the universe so that's what's really cool to me and then can I explain the background? <laughs> yes, so this is my background, one of the uh, things that I'm super excited about. And this is one of the pictures that is most closely associated with dark matter. And dark matter, uh, the last, I think the most, the physics, the physics meetup speaker before me was a dark matter scientist. So this is also one of the things that I really want to work on. And dark matter is super super interesting that's why i want to work on it so what is dark matter so this is one of the biggest biggest mysteries in physics today and what exactly is it so right now we know that i just told you earlier right that science is really cool and we get to know all these things about the universe and we get to know a lot <laughs> but actually in the 1970s ish we found out that that our knowledge of the universe is actually very limited. The amount, our knowledge of science actually just applies to 4% of the universe. And the other 96%, we have no idea what it is. So that's wild, right? Like to think how far we've come with science and to think about all the stories that I've told you earlier, but that's all, that only counts as 4%. There's still 96%. So, what is this 96%? So part of that 96%, like around 23-ish, is dark matter. And that, we don't know what it is. That's why we call it dark matter. Not because it's black or anything, but just because we don't know about it. Uh, we can see it from its effects. Like for example, Deba, like for, for example, if like there's a dark, there's a dark room, right? You're in a dark room, and then may narinig kang, uh, may narinig kang baso na nahulog but you don't see the you don't see the person na naghulog ng baso pero you know that uh from the from hearing the sound of the cup falling you know that something did that and we kind of apply the same thing in dark matter we don't know what's causing all these things but we we can we can see it from its effect so here this picture illustrates that effect so dark matter exerts gravitational influence. So it exerts gravity, but we don't see it. And that's what makes it wild. Because as far as we, uh, right now, all the things that, that have gravitational influence are things that we can see. So for example, stars, planets, uh, gases, even black holes, we can kind of see them from the light that, that surrounds them. But dark matter is weird because we can't see it, but there's gravity in it. And we, we can't see what's producing that gravity when we try to account for all of these things. We don't know where it comes from. So that's what makes it really weird. And we've been on an investigation for many, many decades, and we still have not found anything. And that's what makes it crazy. And so here, that, uh, the blue parts, I, I don't know where I'm pointing at. So here, the blue parts are where the dark matter is, we are where we think the dark matter is. And the, oh, and the pink parts are where we think the matter is, like the normal matter that we know, so like um, gases and all of those high energy gases and things. So that's what makes it super interesting. And I hope, so I hope that <laughs> that was a pretty long answer, but I hope that I also got everyone to know about dark matter. Yes. <laughs> right, so. Next on the mic, we have Mr. Renz Joshua de Vera. Renz? Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, you talk about uh, ultra faint dwarf galaxies. So, how does computer simulations about ultra faint dwarf galaxy work? So, does it take long? Is it hard? Or, inanabubasya ng ilang buwan or ilang araw? Then, 
Yung pangalawa ko pong question is, I'm actually interested in astrophysics and my dream is to become a scientist someday. So, do you have some advice for me so therefore I can pursue my dream in the near future? Something like that po. Yes, oh, that's so cool. Like, I'm really glad to hear that. Okay, the first question, how do, how do the simulations work? What I, like what I said earlier, we have observations of the universe from the telescopes that we have right now. Or like, so we take measurements about the universe right now. So we, uh, like parameters, or we use our telescopes, like the Planck satellite. And this satellite takes measurements from the current universe. And then using those measurements from the current universe, we feed all of those into a computer. And then we also feed it equations that govern how all of the things in the simulation should work. So I'm not sure how to explain this uh, in other terms. So like, for example, if you want to simulate how, uh, if you want to simulate how like an aquarium works, so you will of course try to, you will of course try to put, like observe how the fish in that aquarium Wait, okay, that's a bad analogy. <laughs> okay, let's just give that analogy up. <laughs> but yes, so we try to observe the things that we currently see and then we put that into a computer and then we put also equations. And then after that, we just run it. <laughs> I have no idea how they run it actually because I wasn't part of the people who ran the thing. I'm actually just part of the people who are analyzing the things that the computer spits out. So after you feed it, after you feed it information, you run it in these big supercomputers and they take a lot of time some of them take months and uh but and they're already really really big and high powered and if you put them in weaker computers or slower computers they, they would take months or years so it costs a lot of money to run these things and yeah so it's it just takes a lot of time a lot of money <laughs> that's why the people who do these, this research have to ask for a lot of money and a lot of computing power. So yes. And next question is advice for becoming a scientist. So I think that's just really what I said earlier, just to um, think about why you want to do science. And this feels like a very abstract advice, right? Parang hindi siya actionable masyado. Pero yun nga, like, on your way to become a scientist, it's going to be really hard. So if you just keep stories like that in your head, like the story about the Hubble picture, the Hubble deep field picture, it will, it will keep you going. It will keep you motivated and inspired. And then some actionable tips, uh, some actionable advice I have is to try to study, study very well <laughs> and not try to really understand. And math is super important here. So if you wanna do science, especially physics, math is going to be very important. So try to focus on that. And then there's a lot of resources online, like Khan Academy, for example. It's free and you could learn all you want in there. There's also YouTube. There are a lot of channels and uh, free courses from universities like MIT. So you can go to edx.org, Coursera.org, or MIT OCW. So MIT Open Courseware. Uh, we post, MIT posts all of it, many, many of its classes for free for everyone. You can see our assignments, our projects, all the things that we do, our readings for free. So you could go to mitocw.org. Yes, ocw.mit.edu. Okay, that's the URL, ocw.mit.edu. So use those resources from the internet. So yeah, that's really all of my advice for you. And I hope that was helpful. Okay, we move on to our next question. I hope Miss Hilary, you're, you're still okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. Okay. Um, this question is from Jean Francis Sison from the Philippine Normal University, and he asks, "How does the understanding in physics help or support green movement to combat global environment problem?" Hmm. Well, that's. Uh, I'm not really the best person to ask about that because I'm not very familiar. But from what I know, how can physics help us combat climate change? Not per, not specifically the green movement, but more like to combat the effects of climate change. So what physicists are actually very involved in making all these climate simulations. So 
So every time, di ba, may naririnig kayong uh, predictions from scientists about, okay, in a hundred years, the temperature is going to be four degrees hotter or something, and the sea level is going to rise by like one meter or some number of feet, and then all this ice is going to melt, and then all of these other predictions. And actually, what goes on behind the scenes is also simulations, like the caterpillar simulation, except it's for climate. So what they do is they take all of these parameters, like all of parameters, I mean like measurements from our current planet, and then they feed that into a computer, and then they put some equations in it, and then they make some really, really clever <laughs> equations, and then from that comes out the, predi comes the predictions. And that is really that has a lot of physics involved in it and that involves atmospheric physicists geophysicists uh all these people who study the ocean like oceanographers and there's also how there's there's a specific term for ocean physicists and I've, I've met someone who does that before but yes like you can find physics even in this climate change fi climate field and it's really exciting and it's really useful work and it will really help move society forward. So all of this is really amazing work. And wait, did I answer that question? I kind of got lost. But yes, I hope that, <laughs> that answered the question. Yeah, I'm sure you did. Um, our next question is um, quite interesting. Um, it's just a short question from Cyrus Largo. He asked if, what do you think is scientific progress? And does it really exist? Ah, yes. <laughs> that's actually a very, very deep question. <laughs> uh, it has a very complicated answer, but for me, short answer is yes. Like, scientific progress definitely exists because if we compare it to how much of the universe that we understand now compared to, like, what New Newton, in the time of Newton, in the time of Galileo, or even before that, like, the time of ancient civilizations in Mesopotamia, <laughs> or all of those times in like 10,000 years ago. Compare that to what we know now and how, how powerful our scientific tools have gotten. That for me screams scientific progress. Like some philosophers actually say that scientific progress doesn't exist. And that, that also makes sense, but it's a very complicated answer. And I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but for me, short answer is yes, it really exists. And scientific progress really just means um, gaining more understanding about the universe and what what is understanding understanding for me is predictive power so what is predictive power so predictive power is when you have a, a theory in science and then if you can use that theory to predict something in the future then that means it's powerful enough and it it uh it captures the nature of the universe enough to predict it so for example yung solar eclipse Diba? So, yung solar eclipses, how, how, do you think that, uh, how do you think that scientists get to predict solar eclipses from 100 years from now? So that, that's crazy, right? Like, how, how do they even know these things? Like, how are they able to predict solar eclipses 100 years, 1,000 years from now? They do that because Newton's laws, or like Newton's theory of gravity, they apply that, all the complications of that. They apply that. And then it makes predictions about when the next solar eclipse will come. And the fact that we can make that kind of prediction, that means that Newton's theory is very powerful and it, it is progress. We have made a big leap in understanding. And so that to me is progress. And yeah, you know, like predictive power. And then to think, uh, if we try to think about all of the theories that we have right now that have great predictive power, that means that we really come far in terms of scientific progress. We are now down to our last three questions. And on the mic, I would like to welcome Mr. <clears throat> Theodore Sanchez. Theodore? Okay. Theodore, are you there? Okay, I think he has uh, some difficulty in connect. We'll get back to you later, Theodore. So we'll move on to another question. And this one is from uh, Sorsh. 
Okay. Um, this one is from Charmaine Tablante, and he uh, uh, she asked rather, what can you say about the Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. and is the antimatter true? Yeah. Okay. What can I say about okay. Big Bang Theory? Okay. No, I not even going to feedback. Okay, it's gone now. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, the Big Bang Theory is really cool. It's actually one of the things that we're studying in my class right now. I'm taking this cosmology class with Alan Booth, one of the professors that I showed you earlier. And he was the, one of the people actually who made big leaps, who made big contributions for the Big Bang Theory. And well, I think it's uh, really, I don't know like, what opinions I could say about it because I can't really put my opinions on it. Well, for, it's just a really, for me, it's a really fascinating theory. And it makes it's especially good because it makes uh, good, wait, no. Like we have a lot of evidence for it. Because back then, the Big Bang Theory wasn't well accepted. It wasn't very popular in the whole uh, scientific community a few dec uh, several decades ago. But over time, we have gotten a lot of evidence to support that. And so all of this evidence really uh, points, to, points to this, uh, idea that the universe came from the universe came from this tiny point that just expanded to form the universe that we know today and it's been going that expansion has been going on for 13 14 billion years and i think that's really cool it's a really cool theory and the fact that we have a lot of evidence to back it up means that it's credible, credible enough but of course if we have better theories in the future, then we will have to make room for that better theory. And I forgot what the second question was. Oh, antimatter. Is antimatter real? So yes, antimatter is real. And I actually don't know that much about it. Antimatter is just matter that has opposite charge from normal matter. So for example, like electron, like we, we know from high school physics, right, that electrons have a charge of minus one. And the electron has an antimatter partner that has an opposite charge. So there's an electron that exists, uh, an antimatter partner of the electron that has a plus one charge, which is weird, right? Because all our life we've learned that electrons have minus one charge, but now here comes this discovery of antimatter that has an opposite charge. So that's really wild. And back then, like when we study the big, when we study the early universe, we kind of, we think that uh, there should be uh, like why, we start to ask why our universe is actually made of matter instead of antimatter. Like that's a pretty big topic that I'm not gonna dive into today, but there's this whole, it's also a big field of research right now to, to show why, our universe is made of matter instead of antimatter because there could very well be a universe made of antimatter and it would still work fine. It just has opposite charge, but it would still be fine. But here we now, today, we find ourselves in a matter-filled universe and that's super interesting. So we, that's still a big question. And if you want to investigate that, then that would be great. Right. Okay, so I'm going to try Fyodor again. Fyodor. Can you ask your question live or you still experience some Fedor? Okay, so proceeding with our last two questions and I'm just going to uh, read them all together. The first question is, um, these are from uh, senior high school students joining us today. The question is, who is your role model? And what are your plans after completing your degree in MIT? Role model. I have. I actually have many, many role models. <laughs> and well, my very first role models are definitely my parents because they were always the ones who inspired me. But now I also have other role models. So one of them is actually Dr. Reina Reyes, who was the one who uh, spoke during the opening remarks. She inspired. She inspires me so much. Well because like we have, uh, I think we went through very similar paths. Like we both graduated from Philippine Science High School and now she's uh, an astrophysicist, a professor, and she uh, also 
did research on uh, cosmology, all these cool things. And she also does a lot of research on science communication. And that's why uh, she's one of my role models. So I find her very inspiring. And it's medyo nakakabanga that she, she was here in this physics meetup. And other role models, I really admire Carl Sagan for how he communicates science in such poetic ways. Naka ano, like, every time I read Carl Sagan's words, uh, siya, yung, uh, siya yung gumawa ng quote kanina na I shared earlier about the pale blue dot and all that deep, all those deep poetic things. Those just inspire me so much. And whenever I read Carl Sagan, parang, it feels like it's almost spiritual to me. <laughs> parang lumilitaw ako every time nagbabasa ako sa kanya. So he's one of my other role models. And all of the scientists I also showed you earlier, like Marie Curie, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, I got an, an autograph from her. So they're, they're very inspiring. Okay, and before we finally end the Q&A, let us end with this thought-provoking question from Theodore. Uh, Theodore Sanchez, his question is, if the universe began with the Big Bang, how will it end? Through a big crush, big rip, or heat death? <laughs> They, those are that's actually a very big open question right now and we really don't know but one of the i think one popular one popular guess is that we're gonna end in a heat death and i sadly don't know that much about this thing to speak about it so i don't want to say something wrong <laughs> so i would just recommend that you go you google i know this one channel pbs facetime that makes that makes good a good video on this so yeah, like that's the thing with like physics because it's just so large you can't possibly know all these things. And for me, like I'm still learning. And since I don't want to say something wrong, I would just recommend you go to the source itself. <laughs> so yes. Okay, so this ends our uh, open forum, and uh, we thank you very much, Hillary, for indulging us for answering uh, all our questions, and um. Um, let me request all our 274 participants to give Miss Hillary a virtual round of applause for being so um, accommodating with Thank our you. questions. Now, actually, truth be told, our chat box is bursting with questions signifying how interested people are with astrophysics and with you. And... Um, I'm sorry that we cannot accommodate all of them, but rest assured to our participants, you will be able to convey your questions through the feedback form that you will be receiving in your email. So once again, thank you very much for joining thank you very us much. in our open forum. And now I turn you back to Ms. Um, Ida, our host. Thank you, Ms. Hillary, for such an astounding, inspiring talk. And also Professor Bianca for moderating this session. Thank you to everyone who participated as well. It truly reflects how everyone wants to learn, to know a lot uh, from this meetup. Can we give them again a virtual round of applause? Okay, so now I'd like to call on Professor Bien Butanas, the chair of the physics department of Central Mindanao University to wrap up our session. Sir? Uh, good day, everyone. Um, we are thankful that you join us uh, in this meetup. Uh, we are humbled because in the session, we, Pinoy scientists led by Dr. Reina Reyes and Earth Shaker, founded by Mr. Ralph Abenza, collaborate with us. Both organizations have been incredible in making science inclusive and inspiring. The uh, we, we thank likewise the various physics organizations in Mindanao, namely the Kapisana ng Mga Mag-aaral sa Pisika of uh, MSU IIT, the Caraga State University Physics Department, and the uh, University of Science and Technology of the Philippines Physics Department for their support. For the information of those new, Physics Meetup is a series of online conversations with invited experts in the different fields of physics, the goal primarily is to bring international experts within the reach of college and high school students, physics teachers, and physics enthusiasts, not only in Bukidnon, but also to the rural areas of the Philippines. 
we already had several successful sessions, as you may have noticed through the various social media promotions. We would like to thank our speaker, Ms. Hilary Dean Andales, for her invaluable contribution to being an effective science transmitter. This was proven when Ms. Andales won the International Breakthrough Junior Challenge in 2017. I know that her skills are continuously sharpened. The fact that she's currently pursuing BS Physics in one of the world's leading universities. I am hoping that our participants have gained more inspiration than before. We thank again Dr. Rina Reyes for the opening message, as well as Ma'am Julina Colaste for introducing our speaker, Professor Bianca Pabricante for uh, moderating the Q&A. Again, we thank everyone who joins us today and we are hopeful for your useful support for our next meetup. Thank you and may God bless us all. Thank you, Professor Bien. Ms. Hillary, would you like to say some final words before we close our session? Yeah, okay, so uh, I just, I noticed from the chat that everyone is really already into physics and they have very deep questions. And compared to the usual things that I do, the questions here are a lot more parang mas deep into science, and I really love that. And so I want to thank uh, the organizers of this event for making this happen. This is amazing. And thank you for making physics more accessible to Filipinos, especially those in rural, uh, rural areas. And this is really great work. And I also just wanted to say that if uh, any of you just remember all the action items that I uh, mentioned before, maybe consider being a scientist, and if you're not, uh, support them and amplify their voices, make them heard, and appreciate science, and try to keep uh, try to keep encouraging your peers to do the same. And I hope that I delivered that message for you today. And these days, science communication and the appreciation of science is a lot more important. Uh, I mean, we know that because of COVID, right? And COVID our search for the cure for COVID, for mitigating it, for avoiding it, is all, science is very deeply involved in all of that. And that is one of the reasons why I say that science has a life-saving value. It's not just exciting, it's not just super fun, like when you think about the universe, it's actually, it really matters. And at times it is, it spells the difference between life and death, like my experience with Yolanda. So I hope that, you come out, come out of this session remembering that message that science is exciting and also very valuable. And I hope that you continue to hold that message in your heart and in your mind as you go through your journey through life. And I also hope that you encourage your peers to do the same. So yes, thank you everyone. And if you have, like, if you're interested to hear more about me, I ramble a lot on Twitter. Like I'm also on Facebook and <laughs> If you're interested, I'm on Instagram as well. So you can just search for my name in any of those social media platforms. I also have a YouTube channel, but I don't really post in there anymore. But yes, if you're interested, yeah, I'll try to keep posting. But yes, thank you, everyone. This is a really great experience, and I love being here with all of you. You see your smiling faces. Thank you so much. Salamat. Salamat, guys. Salamat kayo. Ah. Thank you again, Miss Hillary. Before we end this meeting, we would like to invite you to a special event, which is the NASA Space App Challenge organized by NASA USA. To invite us all, we have Mr. JC Toreda, one of the local leads in the Philippines for the NASA Space App Challenge. Sir? Hi, good morning, uh, everyone. My name is and thank you for uh, inviting me here in, um, in your uh, in your meetup, no. What a very um, inspiring morning to to meet you guys and be able to share with you the NASA Space Apps Challenge. So um, I just want to briefly introduce myself. I am um, JC Toreda. I'm a product development and a digital I uh, an IT digital transformation consultant. Um, I'm a previous winner of the NASA Space Apps Challenge way back 2018, and uh, since 2018. The Philippines has been winning the NASA Space Apps, not just locally, but um, globally. Um, it's been three years in a row that we've been uh, um, getting these awards from the NASA Space Apps Challenge. And that is why we are very excited 
uh, for this year because for the first time, um, we are having the space apps not just here in Manila, but we are bringing it um, in Visayas, especially in Mindanao. For the first time, we are bringing NASA space apps in central Mindanao. We're having it as well in Davao. Last year, we already had it in Davao. So, um, just to share with you, I'm just want to share. I just want to share my screen. Okay, uh, just to share with you what NASA Space Apps is all about. Um, maybe some of you already know about this program. Um, it started pro. Uh, it started 2013. Uh, but in the Philippines, um, I think it started around 2015. Um, and then from then on, we've been having the NASA space apps or the this hackathon in, in the Philippines. Uh, it's usually um, held here in Manila, uh, De La Sa in De La Salle University. Um, this is yearly in um, this coming October 2 to 4. We would like to invite everyone, uh, not just coders, um, entrepreneurs, scientists, um, designers, storytellers, everyone we're inviting. Uh, this is not just for um, te technology enthusiasts. Um, we, wanted, we want to invite you all to join this uh, virtual hackathon. For the very first time, we are having the virtual hackathon because uh, all of us know uh, because of the pandemic, we can uh, never have it um, in, in a venue. So, um, just for everyone's information, if you're not aware, um, a hackathon is a 48-hour um, challenge. So participants from around the world will be come together to create virtual teams and solve challenges using NASA's open source data. So um, it's a 48-hour challenge in, in where in, uh, NASA, space, uh, NASA Space Apps releases some of these challenges, which, which later I will uh, walk you through. Um, and then for this year, since um, the, the theme for the NASA Space, App, Space Apps event is Take Action. No? It is a critical reminder that um, we can really make a difference even if we're just uh, working or studying at home. Um, that is the main um, purpose of, um, to the, uh, of this year's theme. And um, as what I've mentioned, in the light of COVID-19 pandemic, um, and in the interest of our global community health and safety, so we will be having the hackathon all in virtual. So all of the uh, local space apps events will converge on October 2. We will be having it virtually via Zoom, um, hosted by the U.S. Embassy and the American Space Center. So what is the purpose of the space apps? So our mission is focused on the following objectives. So we wanted to inspire collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. That is why we are inviting everyone because um, everyone has an idea. Everyone has this uh, creative thinking. Uh, and we wanted to promote that with the NASA space apps. And we wanted to foster interest in earth and space science and exploration. So as we all know, um, even though um, the, the Space Act in the Philippines has already been signed off. It's, it's not that there yet. So it's really good that um, when you were still uh, now, you're, you're still students, you're already aware of this. And maybe in the future, you'll be one of those people who will pioneer or who will work for the space agency in the Philippines. And we wanted also to, ra to raise awareness of NASA data around the world. But uh, this year, it's not just all about NASA data. Japan, Canada, uh, Russia, they, they will be sharing as well uh, their space data no, for the Space Up Challenge this year. And we wanted also to encourage growth and diversity of the next generation of scientists like you guys, our future scientists, our future technologists, designers, engineers, artists. Um, so who should participate in Space Apps? So as what I've mentioned, everyone is welcome. Um, in fact, the most diverse teams are of, uh, often the most successful. So um, Charged to my experience, when, when we joined the NASA Space Apps last 2018, uh, we were only two uh, from the IT industry. Some of my team members who are my good friends as well came from um, a different industry, like from marketing, from, um, from digital design. So uh, it is really good to work with a, at a very uh, diverse team you know, because uh, there's different perspective and there, there's a very diverse um, collective idea. And then by, by having those diverse team, 
you can really um, have a collective approach of um, coming up with an idea or solution in response to the different challenges of the space apps. And uh, the registration is already ongoing. Um, we can share with you the, the links later. So it's uh, 2020spaceappschallenge.org. So you can go to that site and you can just uh, select your location. So um, we, we encourage that you select which, which location is closest to you or the, the, yeah. So like there's one in Manila, in Pampanga, in Davao, in, um, in Cagayan de Oro. And we have also in Soxergen for Central Mindanao. So we've already released the, the different challenges, which later on I'll, I'll discuss uh, briefly. And uh, for team members, um, ideally, you can form a team of a maximum of six. So that's the most ideal. Though some, they only have four to five. And so um, how do you register? So you can go to this. Actually, um, this one is just for Sox Surgeon. But if you can go to this link, the 2020.spaceappschallenge.org, you can uh, just look for the location um, where you wanted to participate. And uh, you should be able to see this um, screen and then just click on register. So, and then that's it. Uh, you should be able to, um, to join the, the challenge. So the most important thing is you register as individual because you cannot participate uh, unless you register as an individual. Later on, it, um, on October 2, that's where you form your team. Uh, with your with your other teammates who've already who or who also registered individually for um, the space apps, and um, the things that you would learn in the space apps, that we, we will be having our boot camps uh, starting October two. For some of the local um, communities, we've already started some of our learning sessions. But ideally, you will learn more about um, ideation, design thinking storytelling, the agile mindset, basics of UI UX uh, for prototyping, of course. And most especially, you will learn more about how you can utilize um, space data to create or to ideate something. So that's, that's something very, very exciting that we're always looking forward every year for, uh, with space apps. So what are the different challenges? So these are the six challenges uh, for this year. You can, um, if you wanted more details, you can go on to the, the website that I've shared a while ago. I can type it also in the, the chat box. So, but um, th these challenges are um, very, very diverse. It doesn't just focus on building applications or tools. You can also um, use your creativity, like making uh, videos using uh, audiovisuals, um, animations, and effects. You can also participate in challenges that if you wanted to create some games, you know, so um, there's a very diverse uh, set. These, these are very diverse set of challenges. And I hope that um, all of you will be interested to join the NASA space app. So you can register, um, I think, at most until October 2. You can just go to the website and then there you can um, get all the information. So yeah, so for more information, you can just, uh, for Soxergen, for Central Mindanao, this is our Facebook page, but you can also go to the, the website of the NASA Space Apps Challenge 2020. And I think, uh, yeah, that's it. So I hope um, some of you, all of you will be able to, to, to join the challenge uh, for this year's Space Apps. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, sir, for that information. Now we would like to invite everyone to open their cameras if you are comfortable for a group picture. So we will have three poses. Okay, so let's start in three, two, one. Another pose in three, two, one. And the last one in three, two, one. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you for joining us in our physics met, uh, meet up session today. We will be giving the certificates after you have accomplished the feedback form where you can write also your messages for our speaker. Thank you and see you in the next session for the physics meet up. Stay safe. Bye everyone. Thank you so Stay much, safe. Hillary, for joining us. Thank yes, you. Thank you for